If you were suddenly transported back in time with just the items on you, just your cell phone would amaze anyone from even a hundred years ago. Go a couple hundred or thousand years ago and you could probably convince them you're a god with just the power of this little device. That is until your battery dies. Which raises an interesting question. What would it take to build a working battery from scratch that could actually charge your phone? I've experimented with this at various historical points and finally have the definitive answer. So pay attention if you're a prospective time traveler, this could be useful knowledge for your future or your past. I've done a few videos now exploring the history of electricity and early forms of it. This includes the fabled Baghdad battery, which I was able to reconstruct and power weak devices like an LED, but never got it to produce much power to do anything useful, even with a large array of them. I also experimented with early forms of static electricity and storing it in what was the origin of the name battery, a Leiden jar. Then I also made the very first battery, the voltaic pile. This unlocked serious potential and historically opened the door to many possibilities. However, the reality of these weak batteries is that you would need a massive and expensive array to do anything practical with a very limited working window of time. I made a beefed up version of it with plates of copper and zinc and using the assistance of the innards of a battery pack, I found I could briefly charge a phone for a minute. Not the most effective of results. The next step in the history of the battery holds the best potential with the Daniel cell. Listen up prospective time travelers. If you are stuck in the past and need to charge your batteries, you're gonna need to build your own and you're gonna need these three rocks. You're gonna need this green one, you're gonna need the yellow one, and you need a gray one. The green rock is native copper, which I was able to collect in Michigan. Nice. The yellow rock is sulfur, which I found and collected just outside Death Valley in California. The gray rock is sphalerite, the ore of zinc, which I collected in Wisconsin. The sphalerite needs to be smelted into zinc using a very specific type of furnace so that the zinc doesn't evaporate out. The sulfur needs to be burned out and the fumes reacted with water to produce sulfuric acid. I found that the addition of saltpeter greatly improved my results, which ends up requiring a whole side quest to extract it from chicken droppings. Some of the native copper then needs to be dissolved in sulfuric acid, forming copper sulfate. One additional step is making a ceramic cylinder and firing it to make a porous earthenware container. The Daniel cell is then constructed by placing a zinc rod into a porous pot and then filling it with the sulfuric acid. This pot is then placed inside a copper pot filled with copper sulfate solution. But first, thank you to today's sponsor, FlexiSpot. With the help of FlexiDesk, get the flexibility of having both a sitting desk and a standing desk that you can easily switch between, allowing you to switch between standing or sitting depending on your mood. It's designed to transform your workday. Check out the stability, even at full height, it has pretty much no wobble. And strength, no problem. The E7 Plus can lift up to 540 pounds, so it can handle pretty much anything you can put on it. A standing desk can boost your productivity, reduce back pain, and improve your overall health. And with FlexiSpot, it's all at a reasonable price. FlexiSpot offers a range of standing desks to meet your needs. Check out their amazing brand, Day Sale, and use promo code in the description for exclusive savings. Visit FlexiSpot.com today and revolutionize your workspace. Don't miss out, upgrade your workspace with FlexiSpot. Looking at the design of the Daniel cell, I can see it's very reminiscent of the actual Baghdad battery, which we made before. So it's kind of understandable if someone was familiar with this battery, they could interpret this artifact to be a similarly designed one itself. The Daniel cell generates electricity similarly to the voltaic pile by using the chemical reaction between copper and zinc. Not very different than your basic lemon battery. When the Daniel cell is connected, the zinc metal oxidizes and releases electrons, which the copper accepts and then deposits, creating the flow of electrons and the electricity that we are after. The porous pot allows the ions to pass between the two, but keeping the two solutions separate. One of the biggest flaws with the voltaic pile is that it would generally only operate for about an hour at best. The electrolyte it would use would produce a film of hydrogen, decreasing the effectiveness of the battery. The genius aspect of the Daniel cell is the use of copper sulfate. Instead of hydrogen, copper will form on the porous pot. And while this will slowly decrease the effectiveness of the battery, copper is conductive, so it doesn't block the exchange of electrons. 
The Daniel Cell proved to be the first practical battery for wide scale use. In fact, the Daniel Cell is what provided the standard for the definition of a volt. Ironically, not coming from the voltaic pile. So with this design in mind, it was time to start experimenting to see what it would take to generate enough power to charge a cell phone. For that, Elliot spent some time experimenting. This is what we have so far. Our main setup here is a series of Daniel cells. And like I said, we have eight of those in series. As you can see, they actually have a pretty decent power output because we were able to run this motor here. What I think is interesting about that is that motor has been running on and off for the last six hours without giving any sign of slowing down. So I think in terms of longevity, the Daniel cell is a fantastic battery. So we find that uh, the Daniel cell, uh, as advertised, produces just over one volt each. So in series, we're getting, um, it comes out to about 8.6 volts, I believe. However, in terms of amperes, I think we're only getting about 60 milliampers. Um, and we wanna be able to get at least half an amp out of this. Generally speaking, with uh, battery cells, uh, the larger surface area of the electrodes and the reactants, the more amperage you'll get. You'll still get the same voltage because it's still effectively the same chemical reaction, but you'll get more amperage out of it. Um, so we're experimenting with zinc plates and also different concentrations of the uh, electrolyte solution uh, to see how many amps we can get out of it. So that's another thing we're working on right now. But still a work in progress. Uh, we're getting somewhere with it, but I think we have a little ways to go. The fact that this battery can run for hours without issue is a huge advantage. However, with such a low amperage, we'd end up needing a ton of them to actually produce enough power for the cell phone, which would get pretty expensive. So I sought out some help from my Discord, specifically user Mr. Talking Machine, who's been able to provide some extra advice on these electrical projects. He suggested switching to a later form of the Daniel cell called the Gravity Cell or Crowfoot Battery. We discovered a few years after the first design of the porous pot version of the Daniel cell, this battery rearranges things into a single container and uses the different densities of the two electrolytes, zinc sulfate and copper sulfate, to keep them separated instead of the earthenware barrier. This reduces the internal resistance of the battery, causing a much stronger current. To construct our own, we'll need to cast some distinctive zinc crow's feet Zinc is used up in the running of the battery, so they designed them with these distinctive crow foot shaped electrodes. Offer a maximum surface area while still being thick enough to last a pretty long time. For the copper electrode, they often made it from sheets of copper in a similar webbed shape. This electrode isn't consumed in the life of the battery, so it doesn't necessarily need to be thick. However, copper and zinc oxide that form will fall and collect at the bottom. So it helps to have them fairly thick. So it always stays above the debris that collects at the bottom. We did an initial test and got a much higher amperage of about a quarter amp, over four times the results of the porous pot. So we scaled things up and prepared an array of batteries. So as expected, we're getting about 8.4 volts. Over one setup, we were not getting nearly the amount of amperage we initially expected, leaving us uh, scratching our heads and having to go back to some troubleshooting. Ah, it feels like a nine volt battery. Oh <laughs> man. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> After a bit of experimentation, we discovered that the issue was actually the distance between the two electrodes. So by moving them closer, we got the amperage levels to what we expected. So it was time to switch to some shorter jars. As a test, I connected two jars to an LED and left it running over the weekend. When I returned, it was still going strong. These batteries are incredibly fascinating to watch. It's almost like a lava lamp. Copper forms on the zinc electrode, and then once it reaches critical mass, it falls to the bottom. As the battery runs, you eventually see the separation of the two electrolytes. The upper clear liquid is the zinc sulfate while the heavier blue solution is copper sulfate. You can monitor the levels between them and know when you need to recharge it with additional copper sulfate. 
Depending on the arrangement and setup, we found out you could get between 0.2 and 0.6 amps out of each battery. So then it was a matter of arranging them into cells of serial wired batteries and then stacking several of these arrangements in parallel wiring, allowing us to get the desired voltage and amperage that we wanted. We ultimately settled on an arrangement of three groups of six batteries, allowing us to reach just over five volts and around half an amp. This should put us right in the ballpark of a low-powered USB plug. Then it was just a matter of plugging in the phone and letting it charge. Unfortunately, the charging was going too slow to leave the screen on so we could actually watch the battery percent rise. So I just had to check in on it periodically as this was going incredibly slow. I ended up leaving it charging overnight and by the next morning, it was still not fully charged. On closer examination, some of the wire holding the zinc electrodes corroded, causing the zinc to fall and short out a couple of batteries. Once fixed, I left it running several hours more. So the total charge time to get from 60% to 100% was 20 hours. But for a lot of that was when the battery was short. So I think it probably would have been able to shorten it up, maybe even just 12 hours to charge to 100%. Having to actually start from 0%, it probably would have taken 30 hours. So it's definitely not a fast charge. But considering we are using 1860s batteries to actually charge a modern cell phone, I'd say that's pretty impressive. This battery design was a huge game changer and ended up becoming kind of the standard for the telegraph system in both the US and UK, sometimes even being used up to the 1950s. So if you are a time traveler who needs to charge their phone, uh, anytime after 1860, you can just stop by a telegraph station and you can probably plug your phone in basically, which is really helpful if you wanna like catch a few snapshots of the Civil War or something. My interest in these batteries is actually to power the predecessor of the modern cell phone, the telegraph. Well, the telegraph seems pretty simple. You're just interrupting electrical signal. You can send a signal at the speed of light anywhere in the world as long as you have wire. As we get uh, a little bit deeper into it, it's turning out a little bit more difficult than that, but it, it's still fascinating how uh, simple telecommunication starts as and where it ends up today. Interestingly, the amount of power you need to actually charge a modern cell phone is pretty similar to what you need to send a signal on a telegraph. So this should actually provide pretty much the amount of power we need for our telegraph. So when I was looking for uh, examples of this battery in action, I came across this film from the 1940s, an old Western called Western Union. Pretty interesting to see these exact batteries all over in the background. Looks exactly like what we recreated. It's definitely interesting to see it in there and get an idea of how these would have looked in an actual telegraph office. Being from the 1940s, it does have a few problematic scenes that are a little humorous to um, look at in retrospect, I think. <laughs> So yeah, you don't want to drink the solution. So trying to make the actual telegraph is going to be a video coming out in a few weeks still. Our goal is to try and get the, an up and running historical telegraph system up for open source, hopefully to allow people to actually try it out and send their own message. Open source is basically a collection of all your favorite maker YouTubers all in one place. You get to interact with them, you get to check out some of their projects, see a bunch of other really interesting things. Uh, I went last year, it was a ton of fun. Really look forward to coming this next time and I hope anybody who can, can make it there and meet in person. Thanks again to all my supporters on Patreon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.